başlıyoruz. Yes, Natalia Vodianova. Welcome to dün, bugün, yarın, which means yesterday, today and tomorrow, the name of our program. Oh, okay, yes. And welcome to Antalya, Turkey. Uh, is it your very first time here in Antalya? Yes, indeed. Turkey? No, You've I've been, been to uh -huh. Turkey. Yes. A few times yes. before. Natalia Vodianova, you are hosting the Let's Talk Talk here in Antalya. Talking is important and do you find it efficient as an ef efficient tool to resolve the problems girls, women are facing today in our world? Well, talking is the way we start. Mm -hmm. It's really about, first of all, getting people together. Mm -hmm. We have gathered here in Antalya today people from all over the world. We have people from India, we have people from US, we have people from Canada, we have people from Poland, from Hungary, from Germany, from, from England, from Russia, from Belarus, uh, really from many, many parts of the world, Africa, of course, as well, and uh, countries, Middle East countries. Mm -hmm. And every voice is represented and every part of the world is represented. What that means? It mm -hmm. means we are not going to point fingers at who is doing what wrong. Mm -hmm. We are talking about our own experience in our own countries, in our own lives mm -hmm. as well. And what we feel is the right thing to do. The purpose is not only to talk, but by starting this conversation also to achieve a working action plan mm -hmm. that we then can also share with activists, policy makers, mm -hmm. UN representatives, government officials from all over the world so they can act on mm -hmm. it but they can also mm -hmm. create, you know, localize mm -hmm. it in a way mm -hmm. and with their group of activists, mm -hmm. their group of NGOs find solutions, sustainable mm -hmm. solutions to this issue, the issue of stigma and taboo mm -hmm. around female health. Yes. Why health? Why did you choose uh, health, the topic? Why? Well, you know, mm -hmm. we, we, we talk a, a lot about gender equality mm -hmm. around the world. This conversation is, is very, very paramount, yes. it's very present, mm -hmm. it's um, really high on everybody's mm -hmm. agenda and everybody's lips. Mm -hmm. However, what makes us women? You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's our female nature. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it starts with our reproductive health. It mm -hmm. starts with something that for whatever reason, different reasons in different parts of the world has become uh, and always has been a subject of taboo and stigma. Mm -hmm. And what happens in this case? What happens when we have these stigmas? And what that means, you know, we're all human beings in the end. But it just so happens that it's boys... It's a natural process. Boys don't have this, you know, mm -hmm. there's no such a thing as shame and stigma around male body. Mm -hmm. But there are plenty around female body. Mm -hmm. and, and if we want to mm -hmm. even question gender equality, mm -hmm. we need to start question those stigmas and taboos around female health. Yes, and women, girls, girls who are, you know, at their young age should become more comfortable and more at ease to talk about it and... Uh, Absolutely, and also boys. Mm -hmm. Boys are, as you heard from many panelists today, mm -hmm. boys are a great part of solution. You know, these panelists, they're not talking... We hear some stories of failure, but also stories of success mm -hmm. and they're... You know, there is data uh, around the fact that if boys are educated mm -hmm. and if boys are brought into this picture of educating people around female health related conditions, menstruation, mm -hmm. uh, reproductive health of a woman, mm -hmm. then by, by default, the both sexes men and women feel more comfortable around the topic. That's very and true. And going forward and also are able to build healthy relationship with each other and and create more transparency uh, with each other and in the future with their children. So this is also about raising awareness uh, for the boys. Of, well, it's, yes. Uh, yes, of course we look at 
men and and boys mm -hmm. as absolutely big part of the solution mm -hmm. because we cannot do it without them. Mm -hmm. It's sort of the way we cannot solve many issues without women uh, taking taking part. Uh, we cannot solve those issues without men in the room, and we have many men in the room. Yes, uh, and gender inequality. Uh, there have been uh, over uh, the years, uh, despite great efforts, you know, shown by governments, by civil societies. Uh, by women's uh, movements, there are girls are still exposed uh, around the world to violence, to abuse, uh, you know, to many things, uh, many sad things, and we see sad news, sad cases, and they still uh, face many uh, other human rights abuses, uh, girls around the world. Uh, what is your solution to this? Do you have any education? Hope? Education is mm -hmm. definitely a solution. Explaining, first of all, a girl mm -hmm. should own her body. Mm -hmm. She needs to be in charge of something that is undoubtedly hers. It's her body. Mm -hmm. She needs to know that she can say no. She can say no to sexual approaches. She can say no. Um, to even sometimes her family, if that's the case, mm -hmm. that's what's needed. And that's if, if it's if something that is proposed and put on the table, it's something she's not agreed, agreeing with. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, we all grow up and we leave the nest. And it's really important in order to build a healthy relationship with our children to allow them a certain choices to, to mm -hmm. be made. And, and, but in general, you know, what we call sexual education, mm -hmm. but, you know, reproductive education, mm -hmm. what, what, how to protect yourself um, mm -hmm. from violence, it's starting by saying no and being very firm about it. Uh, but, of course, the situation is very, very different. And that shame and stigma, it comes, whether it's a girl in uh, sixth grade in U.S., just really shy to ask for a pad of, mm -hmm. from the teacher. Or it's really uh, girls in India and Nepal that completely separated from, from mm -hmm. their families when, uh, uh, when they're menstruating. Or 45% of these young girls fall out of education altogether yes. uh, in sixth grade, uh, or, you know, around the time when their the period comes. Mm -hmm. All this is a, a grave issue that's been, that's been needs to be addressed, but it's absolutely a global issue. Global issue. Uh, and uh, when you just mentioned uh, girls not, being, not having shame and not being shame of what they are going through, uh, and maybe talking out loud. So I want to take this uh, topic a little bit to, towards the Me Too movement, maybe. Uh, women uh, talking out loud uh, about their experiences of abuse, of harassment. It has started with Harvey Weinstein and it has spread uh, out throughout the world now from America uh, till India even now. Has it reached Turkey? Yes, but not as much as uh, in America. Um, I think there will still be, you know, other cases. We will be hearing many stories throughout these years. Uh, do you believe this movement has uh, achieved success? You know, today we live in a world of social media, internet, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a world when a person who, from outset, mm -hmm. do not have a voice, can actually have a voice and can be supported by the community. Mm -hmm. And Me Too movement has shown, as you know, many other movements out mm -hmm. there, that something can become viral mm -hmm. and, and something can, can really mobilize people uh, uh, around change. What happened is, um, you know, there, there, there are certain controversies because, of course, movements like this will also be used for some people to get revenge on, mm -hmm. you know, someone who maybe you know, hurt them in the past in a different way, but, you know, it's taken as an opportunity to, yes. to punish someone who's mm -hmm. been mean to you. And that's wrong, you know. But uh, certainly 
it probably means that in the future these men that use their power uh, to access women and their bodies they will think twice before doing that mm -hmm. because that can end their career they, they will can, have the fear they can maybe. become a public knowledge mm -hmm. yes the fear is there mm -hmm. and these perpetrators they will you know they will think twice mm -hmm. before doing it and this is already a great result until now there has been i think two 201 200 and men 201 men with you know uh, famous names uh, well known uh, who have been who had to quit their jobs their titles because of this when we go to the past we always talk about the past in our program uh, you have founded 14 years ago the naked uh, heart foundation uh, when you founded it, what was your idea uh, behind this? I know, I've read it, but I like uh, our viewers to know in Turkey more about this, what you went through with your uh, sister, uh, Oksana. Uh, we like yes. to hear it from you. So the mission of Naked Heart Foundation is to build an inclusive world mm -hmm. through providing family support services, evidence-based practices, uh, mm -hmm. to families raising children with special needs to prevent institutionalization because mm -hmm. many children with special needs, much less now um, since uh, the last 15 years, the situation mm -hmm. has changed dramatically, luckily. Um, but m many of these children still end up in mm -hmm. institutions and many are living in institutions today and also through building safe and inspiring places to play. Mm -hmm. For me, I wanted to, when I started Naked Heart Foundation, I started with something very tangible, very concrete, something that the donors can see the effect of um, and see exactly where the money is going, transparency is... Uh, is uh, and how their lives are changing. And, and how the lives of children are change, mm -hmm. changing, but also play you know we started with playgrounds mm -hmm. and th that's where transparency came into place but also play it's incredibly important for child's development mm -hmm. this is, has been uh, proved by scientists that child is learning by playing mm -hmm. and child is learning by mimicking other children and people around him mm -hmm. so when we when we have these inclusive spaces where children with special needs mm -hmm. are welcomed together with uh, typically developing children, then they can learn from each other. They can interact in a safe, uh, positive environment uh, where they're both children who love to run or who love to swing, who, who, yes. who love to do, you know, what all children love to do. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so since seven years, we also expanded our work to uh, to working um, in schools, kindergartens, uh, we have family support mm -hmm. centers, we have early intervention program which is for children under uh, five years old. Mm -hmm. We have programs for young adults with special needs like my sister Aksana who is um, today attending one of the, our family support centers. She's in Russia now still, yes, right? In your my, hometown. My, 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 my sister lives, Aksana lives with my mom. Mm -hmm. and, but she's also actually, we, um, we also have a program which called Assisted Living, mm -hmm. which is incredible. It's first in the country. Mm -hmm. We have apartments uh, for uh, young people with very severe autism. Mm -hmm. Uh, that where they can live uh, a semi-independent life. They have, uh, they have each their own bedroom, mm -hmm. but they have common space and they have an assistant who helps them to do daily tasks like cooking or cleaning or going to the shops to going buy groceries. To walk out maybe. Yes. Some of them um. will need the uh, super, supervision and um, um, assistance at most times but a lot of them can live independently mm -hmm. but what it means it means that it takes this burden of the mother away that she will never know what will happen to her child if something happens to her 
uh, but it's still done in a very you know, legal and uh, safe and friendly environment, unlike institutions. Mm -hmm. um, that work also was uh, possible because the play parks uh, spread um, throughout different regions mm -hmm. of Russia very quickly because it was so tangible and simple. We work with the local governments, mm -hmm. uh, and and that enabled us to to meet uh, local governments and to you know to break this ice that and we are yes. friendly NGOs uh -huh. and we are just there to help. And they become more inclusive in the society. This is one of the uh, results Absolutely. I believe because I've read what I've read. Uh, was that your own experience with your sister when uh, you found out and your mother found out she was diagnosed with uh, autism um, that uh, in your hometown uh, people uh, were not very inclusive about disabled mm -hmm. and uh, in the country also I think it, does it still exist this uh, they sent the children to an orphanage? To an institution, yes. Ones. Unfortunately, it still exists, mm -hmm. but much less so than, uh, than it was mm -hmm. um, seven years ago when we started working with families. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, like my family, um, if family doesn't have any support, mm -hmm. it often means that um, a mother is left alone because men often leave, they cannot take the pressure, they don't see the future, they don't understand how to cope with it. And, and so my mother had to raise two children on her own with absolutely no help from the government. The pension, you can't call it a, a help because it's a, it's a very small pension and, and it's really not enough uh, even to buy a pair of shoes for a child. My mother had to work really hard and this is a story of really thousands and thousands of women uh, yes. like my mom. But unfortunately, those brave ones uh, who have kept their children at mm -hmm. home, they're, they're, they're very divided. They're, um, and, and also until recently, there hasn't been many parents' organizations mm -hmm. because women are so busy trying to provide for their own family. They have no time for this kind of activity where they can gather together, share experience mm -hmm. uh, uh, about their children. And, and we grew up uh, with Aksana in total isolation. Mm -hmm. We, you know, everywhere we went, we, we felt hostility. We felt that people didn't want us there, that people judged her and mm -hmm. me for, um, you know, for, for just being there, just, <laughs> just existing. You, and, and getting kind of on their way. So cruel. This is well, you know, the world is cruel, but it's, it's, it's what we do about it that, that makes a difference. Because you can't blame people that never seen a disabled, mentally disabled yes. girl before in their life. So it's really about inclusion, about uh, changing the norms, mm -hmm. uh, saying that these people and these issues uh, have place in the society. And, and these people can contribute to, to the world. What is your advice to the parents of those children diagnosed uh, with uh, autism or cerebral palsy? What is your advice to those parents? Well, my advice is go to nakedheart.org mm -hmm. and, and listen to our lectures that are both available in Russian and English. For now, it's only English. We mm -hmm. would love to translate it to many languages, in, including Turkish. Maybe we will do it with our partner organizations like Special Olympics. Mm -hmm. But you can get a lot of information there just about the many beautiful lectures mm -hmm. on only evidence-based practices. Mm -hmm. Don't try some kind of, you know, things like horses and dolphins and, and art therapy and, and play therapy. They're all wonderful things when it comes to um, um, extracurriculum yes. program. Mm -hmm. But this is not what is going to help your child to adapt to this world. So if your child, if you suspect your child has autism, or if you have been diagnosed with autism 
uh, your child mm -hmm. been diagnosed with autism, please seek only evidence-based practices. And uh, you yourself are a survivor. We are coming to the end of the interview. I know you don't have too much time. Uh, uh, you yourself a survivor. When we look at your life, your early days in Russia, uh, from your hometown to now you live in Paris, a uh, big change, you went through a lot, uh, you fought sometimes for your life, for your goals. Uh, what would you say, uh, and then it led you to found this foundation, uh, you always go uh, to your goals through kindness, I see in you. What is kindness for you, your own definition of kindness? Hmm. Well, I, I, I through your experiences I in life. I hear two questions there. First of all, yes. you know, this relationship with survival. Mm -hmm. I have, uh, I have indeed born into circumstances where dreams were, you know, so far away from, from my mind. I mm -hmm. had no time to dream. I, I only could think of what are we going to eat tomorrow? What mm -hmm. am I going to wear? You know, I, I used to wear shoes for, for, for years mm -hmm. and they would become too small for me, but I had to, you know, keep keep wearing them because you know it's Russia <laughs> it's cold and mm -hmm. you need something on your feet but my mother couldn't afford me to buy another pair of shoes this is indeed it's mm -hmm. it's a survival and when you live a life like this mm -hmm. if suddenly by chance like in my in my uh, in, in my case you mm -hmm. your life changes dramatically and really really dramatically and you suddenly become you know, you become comfortable beyond mm -hmm. your needs uh, and beyond, you know, your ever expectations. Mm -hmm. um, my dream only was n to be safe and to feel safe financially and not to think of where where is that bread coming from mm -hmm. uh, the next day. Well, I achieved much more than that. And, Way and, much more. And, and, you know, th so this, this whole baggage mm -hmm. that I... I lived throughout my childhood, it didn't live suddenly, it does not disappear suddenly. And I was still carrying it where I did not need to carry it. But you know, there's nothing you can do when you've been surviving, you have this, you have this need to, to, to do something. Mm -hmm. you, you have this energy that you've, it's sort of, imagine if you have a, it's actually like a boat like a ferrari you yes. know it's a if you if you don't use those engines mm -hmm. they um, deteriorate very very quickly and and but there's uh, resilience maybe well right? you know this they deteriorate so you have to use it mm -hmm. but instead of surviving mm -hmm. i turn this baggage into a toolbox and a way to you know to give back to those millions of people i left behind in a situation that I was growing up with mm -hmm. and that I know far too well and that is really still very present and is with me and mm -hmm. it's encouraging me on behalf of those who are still in that situation to, to continue fighting. Mm -hmm. So I'm not surviving anymore, but I'm fighting. I'm fighting for something that is bigger than me, something that's bigger than my story, something that is a story of really hundreds of thousands even millions of people around the world where we talk about shame and stigma around disability or where we talk about shame and stigma around um, uh, female health mm -hmm. this is an issue that that is global and and I feel I feel empowered to do something about it and I'm sure very happy when you go to sleep at and night. so my definition of kindness mm -hmm. is um, Kindness, it's really about, you know, helping, helping yourself to, to help others. And, and, and kindness, it's not something that is unnatural to us, but then it it's, has to be a practice. You have to practice kindness in your relationship with yourself, with people around you, and especially in the moments mm -hmm. when you are challenged. If you're kind when you're feeling good, and when you are, you know, in, in, in good mood and everything is good mm -hmm. and you're rich and you're, 
beautiful and you, I don't know, whatever it is mm -hmm. that makes you feel good and that you need. If you are, uh, and when you're successful, of course, if, you, if you're kind in those circumstances, that's not kindness, that's just normal. Mm -hmm. But kindness needs to be practiced when you're challenged, when someone is, you know, super mean to you, you and, and, going and through attacking, times attacking you, when you're going through difficult time. Um, and I'm not saying that I'm perfect at that. I, 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 I'm working on that myself, but I would say that this is, the kindness, it's when we go out of boundaries of, uh, of our own emotions, of our own abilities, and try to come out of that box and do much more than we even expect from ourselves. Natalia Vodianova, thank you very much for this thank very you. interview. You have anything to say to the Turkish viewers from here? Uh, well, I, I just want to wish everybody to, to be accepted and um, for their ultimate uh, purpose and, and, and opportunities to be, to be fulfilled. And we are expecting... Men or women. <laughs> and we are expecting you back to Turkey to see you, to do this, uh, you. you know, work for I women. I hope so. And I hope to uh, be back. Your kindness spreading around the world. Uh, was a pleasure meeting you. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank you so much. Thanks. Evet dün bugün yarının sonuna geldik sayın seyirciler. Önümüzdeki hafta bir başka konu ve konukla yeniden karşınızda olacağız. Ben çok keyif aldım bu sohbetten. Umarım sizler de almışsınızdır. Hoşçakalın.